Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for visiting the YouTube channel for bestbiblecommentaries.com. It's Theology Thursday, and in this video, I'm going to talk about Merrill Unger and demonology. Before I get into it, I invite you to subscribe to this channel if you're interested in seeing videos on biblical studies resources. Clicking the thumbs up on my videos really helps me out because it pushes videos out to people who might be interested in them. That's probably how some of you um, found my videos is because other people click the thumbs up button. So I'd appreciate that. And uh, feel free to leave a comment or ask a question down below. Have you ever changed your mind on a theological topic? Have you ever changed positions or adopted a new perspective on a certain theological matter? You know, when that happens for biblical scholars or for, for pastors, for theologians, I find it completely fascinating. I am just so utterly fascinated when someone changes their mind. Um, and so, and that's really kind of the story of the video is how a Bible scholar, well-known Bible scholar, Merrill Unger, changed his mind about demons. Uh, when I encounter a theologian or a commentator who changes their mind about something, they've held one position for perhaps decades, even argued for it in in written works, like is the case with Merrill Unger, and then change their mind later. It's just it's just very interesting to me, and um, and and that's the story here. So this is going to be an example of that. So Merrill Unger is a well-known Bible scholar in the 20th century. He lived from 1909 and passed away in 1980. I think a lot of people probably know him from um, some of his reference works, like um, the Unger Bible Dictionary, and the other one I think is a Unger Bible Handbook, uh, if I remember the title correctly. Uh, so that's how that's all, mostly how people know the word or the, know the name Unger. But um, in relation to systematic theology, one of his primary areas of focus was uh, demonology. And you can tell all three of these books I'm showing you in this video, they're all written, three different books, all written by Merrill Unger. The fascinating thing is that they have different perspectives. So um, Merrill Unger wrote Biblical Demonology, a Study of Spiritual Forces at Work Today, in, it was first published in 1952. I think there's some revisions after that, but it was first published in 1952. And it was, it came from his uh, doctoral work at Dallas Theological Seminary. So he turned his dissertation into this book. And um, in this book, he argues that only unbelievers can be possessed. Now, let me just back up for a second. If you're not familiar, or if you haven't spent a lot of time studying uh, the doctrine of demonology, one of the conversations, sometimes one of the debates that happens in that uh, discussion is the extent to which a believer can be influenced or possessed by demons. Uh, now, generally, most scholars will say uh, regarding unbelievers that kind of anything goes. Um, there's not really any uh, boundaries um, there. But when it comes to the extent that a demon or Satan himself can influence, affect, possess a believer, um, there's some disagreement. Some scholars say uh, believers cannot be possessed or demonized, and other scholars say they absolutely can be possessed or demonized. And so that's where Merrill Unger changes his mind. Now, just a word on terminology uh, before I move forward. So some scholars don't like the word or phrase demon possession with, with regard to believers. They prefer the word uh, demonization. So the reason why I'm using the word possession, demon possession, in this video is because that's the phrase that Merrill Unger uses in all of these books. All right, so now let's continue the story. So in biblical demonology, Merrill Unger teaches, whoops, Merrill Unger teaches that um, he says to demon possession, only unbelievers are exposed to demon influence, both believers and unbelievers. So there he's making that distinction. Unbelievers can be possessed. Believers can't be possessed possessed. And this is more, this book is more of, a, um, you know, a full treatment of demonology, um, kind of like in the, in the framework of a systematic theology. So it's only part of the book. 
uh, that's about uh, possession, uh, influence and possession, and who can and can't be influenced or possessed. Um, and so, but this is really the key phrase that to demon possession, only unbelievers are exposed to demon influence, both believers and unbelievers. And so regarding that subject, that discussion, that's his position in his first book published in 1952. All right. In 1971, Unger wrote this book, Demons in the World Today. And in this book, he changes his mind. Now, let me just point out right away <laughs> that um, I my copy of this book is just so beat up. It was one of those I bought online in Acceptable. There should be a, a category below Acceptable because that's what this book would be. There's just it's coloring all over it, writing all over it. That's not mine. But anyway, it's only a couple of dollars and it kind of serves the purpose of me just explaining uh, this topic. So in Demon in the World's Demons in the World Today, Unger changes his mind and he also talks about why he changes his mind. And that's just one of the things, like I was saying, just so utterly fascinating to me. Uh, he says, in biblical demonology, that would be this book, in biblical demonology, this author, referring to himself, this author stated, quote, to demon possession, only unbelievers are exposed. So that's the passage I just read you out of this book. Uh, Unger continues, this statement was inferred. So this is Unger explaining to the reader what he was thinking in his dissertation work that turned into his first book. He says, this statement was inferred. Since scripture does not clearly settle the question, it was based on the assumption that an evil spirit could not indwell the redeemed body with the Holy Spirit. And I'll continue in a moment, but it, again, it's just so fascinating to me that he, he's almost arguing with himself, <laughs> quotes himself to argue with himself. Um, I don't know if he found any humor in that. I find a little bit of humor in that personally, but all right, let me continue here. He says, since the first publication of Demonology in 1952, the author has received many letters from missionaries all over the world who question the theory that believers cannot become demon possessed. They claim to have witnessed cases of repossession among converts from ancient idolatrous cultures, such as in China and India and also among Aboriginal people in prim primitive civilizations who live in servile fear and abject bondage to Satan and demons. The claims of these missionaries appear valid, since Christians in enlightened lands where the Word of God and Christian civilization have restrained the baser manifestations of, de of, demon of demonism can sometimes become victims of demon influence and oppression. To what extent can a Christian become occultly oppressed and enslaved? The counseling experience of Dr. Kirk Koch, or Koch, not sure, um, and others have established that occult involvement often results in demonic oppression or subjection that will sometimes affect the third or fourth generation. Cross reference Exodus 20, verses 3 through 5. The family members who become believers can be affected and in need of deliverance, even if they have not dealt in the occult. Uh, last paragraph. Believers who persist in flagrant sin may be driven by demons into emotional instability, insanity, or even suicide. Severe demonic influence can produce enslavement and subjection, even if it does stop short of actual possession. Believers need to heed the warning. Be composed. Be on your guard. Your accuser, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion in search of someone to devour. First Peter 5, 8. So he talks about it more in that book, but that's really kind of the heart of the argument he has in, in that book. So in this book, he's saying believers cannot be possessed. In this book, he's saying it's possible. And one of the things that really triggered him to rethink his position was all of the... Um, letters he got from missionaries in response to this book, Biblical Demonology. I'll say more about kind of the kind of the reaction to what led him to change his mind. I'll say more about that in just a moment. I just want to finish up and talk about this third book here. So in 1977, Unger wrote What Demons Can Do to Saints. And in this book, he discusses uh, Christians being possessed, yet it's, it's, it's the subject of the whole book um, because he got a lot of attention from because he changed his mind from biblical demonology to demons in the world today that just it kind of created a stir 
among scholars and among theologians. And so this book, he came out with, like I said, 1977, then he passed away three years later. So this is kind of his last words um, on the topic. So um, he says, just a summary statement, Other, he says... Um, he talks about other believers have a more realistic view. They are fully convinced that satanic powers may not only tempt and attack, but that if they are not repulsed, they may affect the saint's life and do serious harm in, in his experience. So the saints mean in a Christian's life. So they may influence, delude, dis, despoil him. Always, however, they attack the saint without, from without, but never exercising total control over him. To such people, the possibility of a born-again believer being invaded by one or more demons is preposterous and in their view unbiblical. Um, he says that there's a third class of believers hold to what seems to me the most realistic view. Grievously sinning saints, and such there are, may go beyond the old nature. In cases of serious, persistent, scandalous sin, such as gross immorality or participation in occultism or occult religionism, demons may exercise control over the believer for a time until his sin is confessed and forsaken and deliverance from the evil powers is gained. All right, so he he mentions Christians cannot be possessed in this book. He discusses more thoroughly that Christians can be possessed in this book, and the extent to which believers can be influenced and possessed is the entire subject matter of the third book. So that's kind of the, the story of these three books. Now, let me end with this. Um, what actually led me to this story is reading this book, um, uh, a few years ago, Demon Possession and the Christian, A New Perspective by C. Fred Dickinson. This is a Crossway publication, um, published in 1989. Dickinson was at Moody, I believe. Yeah, Moody Bible Institute. Um, and so in this book, he is actually arguing for the position that er, uh, Merrill Unger arrives at eventually, is that um, Christians can be influenced to the point of possession may be rare, um, but it's possible. And in this book, he talks about Unger changing his mind. Um, and it's that passage that kind of led me to find um, Unger's books uh, on the topic. And what he talks about here is um, he kind of just tells Unger's story about how he changed his mind. And then he talks about um, the criticism that Unger got for it, because as he explained in in um, this book, Demons in the World Today, it was it was missionaries that sent him letters that really opened his mind. And um, he said in um, he said in this book, he got really criticized for that. Um, and uh, because. Um, people were saying that he was changing his mind based on the experience of missionaries um, rather than the teachings of scripture. So um, he, in, in this section here, um, Dickinson says, uh, several have charged that Unger changed his teaching on the basis of experience, thus minimizing biblical doctrine. To be fair to Unger and the facts, we must credit Unger with the courage to confess his error in improper interpretation and improper induction. He did not deny or modify what Scripture clearly teaches. He, ad he admitted, as should we, that the Bible does not clearly teach that Christians cannot be demonized. Furthermore, he forcefully states, doctrine must always have precedence over experience, nor can experience ever furnish a basis for biblical interpretation. And there's a little bit more discussion on that. Uh, in this chapter, Dickinson is actually talking about a couple of different people who um, changed their mind on the issue after experiences that they've had. So, um, so there's that book, Demon Possession and the Christian. So, all right. So, uh, you know, let me know in the comments uh, what you think. What do you think about people changing their mind? What do you think about uh, Merrill Unger changing his mind from one view on demons to another and the basis that he used for uh, changing his mind? Um, do you think it was just experience or did the experience of the missionaries cause him to look at scripture differently? So yeah, it's, it's just fascinating discussion to me. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments section. Thanks for watching.